Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to tonight's Masterclass webinar, A Property Update with Dr. Nicola Powell. Uh, tonight's webinar is brought to you by real estate investor and Terry Shear. So look, just to ensure that you get the best webinar experience tonight, please make sure that uh, your volume is turned up if you can't hear me uh, clearly. And if you're downloading anything or running any applications such as Dropbox, Skype, Outlook, uh, I would recommend that uh, if you could close them down for the next hour, that way you'll have a faster internet speed and uh, better quality audio. Uh, just a quick general advice disclaimer as well, just to um, remind you that this presentation really just contains general information only and it doesn't take into account your personal objectives, financial situation or your needs. So uh, obviously before you act on any of the information provided tonight uh, by Nicola or myself, uh, please uh, we do recommend that you seek uh, advice from a financial advisor or your accountant before making uh, any financial decisions. So my name is Dennis Wong and I am the Product and Training Manager here at Real Estate Investor. And tonight I'm joined by Dr. Nicola Powell, who's the data scientist at the Domain Group, He's, who is going to share with us her insights into the property purchase journey, including tips for buying off the plan and buying established versus new property. Now we will have time uh, for questions at the end of the webinar, so uh, please feel free to uh, type uh, any questions into the uh, go to webinar control panel there and uh, we'll uh, try to answer as many as, as we can and thank you everyone uh, for your time tonight and we really do hope you enjoy tonight's content. So before we kick off, for those who have joined us tonight that have never heard of Real Estate Investor, uh, we provide essentially an on -site, online suite of tools and we've been around for 11 years now. We were founded in 2006 and the whole aim was to simplify uh, real estate investment. Now we're based out on the Gold Coast and uh, look, some of the tools that we do provide include investor search, it's an ability to help you or investors find deals quickly, My Value, My Research, which is powered by Price Finder, allows you to obtain sales, listings, suburban rental data across Australia. Now we currently have over 260,000 investors who have subscribed to our free membership, uh, which gives them access to a lot of educational resources, content, suburb reports and data. Now we are a publicly listed company and we have a heavy investment in our products uh, and our board has a lot of property experience and we've got Simon Baker who is the former CEO of realestate.com.au and the current CEO of Domain, Anthony Catalano. Now we don't do this all, all on our own, we do have a number of partners that we uh, work with that help us and help investors like yourself get the best possible outcome when it comes to property investing. Now our mission statement sums up what we do. We provide property investors around the world with the best advice, guidance, products and services to enable them to create wealth through property investment. So look, we still have a few people joining in, so welcome along everyone. And for those who have never tuned into one of our webinars before, look, these are designed uh, to be educational and for investors at all levels. So welcome along guys. Uh, and look, whether you're just starting out or you're an experienced one, uh, or perhaps you're investing part-time or, or full-time, Hopefully tonight you'll get a lot of value out of the content presented by Nicola. Um, now I would also like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Terry Shear who has kindly helped make tonight's webinar possible. Now for those that aren't aware, Terry Shear are Australia's first landlord insurer and they are part of the Suncorp group uh, and they aim to help their customers realise their capital and financial growth obje objectives by protecting their investment property and rental income streams from common tenancy related risks. So their products, they cover landlords for loss of rental income, damages to fittings, fixtures and furnishings, as well as damage to your building. So it really does protect both your property uh, and your income. So let's get started. It's now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Nicola Power, data scientist at the Domain Group. Now tonight Nicola will provide property purchase tips for your investment journeys, including tips for buying off the plan and buying established versus new properties and investment in houses versus apartments relative to their rental value and resale potential. So Nicola, um, can you hear me? Are you, are you, are you there? Okay. Fantastic. Well, welcome along and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So what I'll do now, I'm just going to uh, now obviously technology and, uh, and, and requiring it uh, in a live uh, space. Let's see if this works. So I'm just going to switch this across to you <laughs> now. So bear with us, everyone. 
All right, so I'm going to send you over the presenter settings and fantastic. There we go. So we can see your screen. We all good? We're all good. So welcome Nicola and uh, yeah, look, take it away. Thank you, uh, and yeah, th thanks for having me on. So yeah, I am a data scientist for the Domain Group. Um, I'm a researcher um, by background, and so one of my passions is actually providing insights um, for consumers and insights that they can actually use. So you know, I'm always looking at data, and I'm always researching, and so I've put together a little bit of a packet package of a who, what, and when, and I'm, I've called it Investor Insights. So um, let's get cracking. So I want to start off by thinking about the who, so who is actually buying, because I think it's actually really important to understand the type of prof property investor that you actually are, um, to allow, allow you to develop the appropriate investment um, strategy that you actually want um, uh, to go along. Um, it's a key element of that investment journey. So I always think, you know, one of the best questions to start asking yourself when you're on that investment journey is, what type of property investor am I actually and what are your investment goals? So I actually like to think that there are three main types of attitudes uh, towards property investing and I call them the passive, the active and the analytical, which I'd probably say I'm a bit of the analytical side. But to um, Describe what I actually mean by this. So a passive um, investor is somebody who does very limited research and has limited understanding of the actual market environment. They have little understanding of the fundamentals um, that make um, a property investment successful. Um, and by things like that, I actually mean, you know, portfolio building and diversification and the taxation and everything, all, all of the variety of plethora of the things that come along with being a property investor. They tend to move quickly and make purchases emotionally. So often they tend to buy um, an investment that they want to use as a holiday home as well. The active investor is somebody who does um, mid-research, I call it. So they do some time is spent researching and understanding what makes a great investment opportunity. They actually take a more active approach towards that investment um, um, strategy, and they take time to understand those fundamentals. They seek professional advice, which, you know, as Dennis was saying, is such an important aspect on that investment journey. Is professionals are out there, and they have a, an immense amount of information. And so, you know, calling on the, those uh, professionals is, is paramount on that investment journey. It's a more well-rounded well approach, um, the type of investor who is an active one. And the analytical is devil is in the detail, and I have to say I probably fall into this category. It's somebody who analyzes every inch of the market. Um, they seek extensive advice and they have a detailed approach, but sometimes because they conduct so much due diligence by significant amounts of information from professionals, what it actually means is sometimes they miss an opportunity because they actually take a little while to commit. So I, I want to then move on to, to talk about this three sorts of property investors. So this is the type of property that you're actually looking for. Um, so there's obviously the, the renovator, um, which they, they buy property to add uh, a cosmetic or structural value over time. It's also referred to as flipping, and I think we're probably all aware of uh, the major shows that are on uh, TV that we see that inspires us to, to do those renos. Um, they actually see it as a very short-term um, investment, um, and, you know, it's about buying property that's undervalued, having realistic profit margins and sticking to that renovation budget so they can make and maximize profit. Then you have um, the developer. They buy property to add density. So this is kind of a short to midterm um, look. They they add density, perhaps it's a subdivision, perhaps they're land banking, you know, they, they, they buy a, a property with the, the prospect of actually subdividing that in the future, or perhaps it's to add um, um, structural value and extension, or perhaps it is really to do a, a small development of units or townhouses. Then you've got your classic investor which is your landlord. Um, so they have a bit more of a passive approach um, and it's a mid to long term view. The classic investor looks for properties to create um, that long term wealth um, and they have a long term view in, in investing in property. You know, it is all about that capital growth, the rental income and the tax off off offsets that are associated with that. 
So I'd now want to move on and talk about uh, what to buy. Um, you know, there's been a long-term debate over whether purchasing a house or a unit, or even purchasing new, or should I purchase established, or even whether, you know, particularly in, in the climate that we're currently in, where it is um, a building boom in Australia, um, whether to purchase off the plan. So in the next few slides, I actually want to just present to you some of the key uh, uh, research that I've actually found and insights on, on my own property journey, because obviously this is something I do um, on an everyday basis. So I want to start with the, probably one of the biggest property uh, debates um, is you know, whether you buy, what type of property, sorry, you buy. So whether it's a house, a unit, an apartment, or, or even a townhouse. But I think there's something that you need to think about before you get to that point of the type of property you're actually going to invest in. Because I really do think it is dependent upon the market and the particular investment strategy that you are after in the long term. You know, is it for capital growth or is it for cash flow or perhaps tax benefits? From the offset, I actually feel it's the most important to focus on the market rather than the actual property type. Consider it from this perspective, you know, a property, you've got to see a property as a static commodity that reflects the state of the economy in the market. What actually grows, grows is the economy, and if the economy grows, the property grows as well. So there are three key things you need to start thinking about before you even get close to thinking about the property type, and that is firstly um, economics. You know, have a look at economic indicators. You know, before you even consider the type of property you want to purchase, you know, it, it, you can identify, in, perhaps you've identified a region that you want to invest in. You know, there's a variety of different um, ABS stats that you can, can pull upon and draw upon, and also the domain data. So, you know, have a look at identifying what's actually driving the economy. You know, what does that jobless rate actually look like, and how is it changing? And what are the main drivers of the economy in the particular area that you want to invest? And is it earmarked for change? You know, it, it, for example, a, a mining town, for, for example, you know, that, that obviously goes through massive boom and bust cycles. So, you know, once that part of the economy is taken away, you obviously get the bust cycle that, that ensues from that. So identifying um, areas, whether it's the city or towns, that have potential to create uh, jobs. With job creation, obviously, comes people, and with that comes a demand for Home, homes and and so it's really identifying those key economic indicators before you even start that property type journey. The second is supply and demand. You know, have a look at the research, have a look at the area and research into that area that you want to particularly buy in. Domain has access to data where you can have a look at uh, what's for sale. You can have a look at past sales history. You can have a look what's on the market. So it will give you uh, an idea of, of what the demographics of that suburb looks like. You know, what is the split between houses and units? What is in most demand? What's going to be the best investment strategy? But also have a look for what's in the pipeline. ABS actually released statistics, and it drills down even to the suburb level. So you can have a look at what's earmarked for development in, in particular suburbs or areas. And obviously, that's gonna, that, that supply pipeline will eventually affect the growth or, or the rental potential of your particular um, apartment, house, or unit, or whatever you decide to to buy. So those approvals really help to paint a true picture. And it could, if you're going to see a, a strong influx of supply, impact the ability to actually find a tenant. And the third one and final one um, is the price point. Um, so consider what your price point is. I mean, under um, the low interest rate environments that we are in, it's probably really um, 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 easy to overly um, extend yourself, but what you have to actually bear in mind is that in what it happens if interest rates rise, and what does that mean about the finan financial implications on your property. Um, you know, in terms of price point as well, you know, have a look at the suburb and look at the level of growth that's already occurred in that suburb um, and prospects for the uh, future. Areas for potential gentrification are really our hotspots in terms of areas to invest in. Areas that have already had that significant price growth, you may have missed that boat there. So the property debate. Now, now we get on to the type of property. So, you know, a house or a unit, whether you want to call it a unit or, or apartment by unit, I mean, you know, mid uh, to high rise density. There are five 
factors that I would probably consider when you're trying to decide whether to purchase or a, a unit or, or a house. Obviously the first one is purchase price. I mean units offer a more affordable entry price point and often there are locations that may be beyond an investor's bu budget if they were looking to purchase a house in terms of where they are located. Often you can purchase closer to the CBD at a lower price point than if you were buying a detached home and those inner city locations are really attractive to tenants. I mean, when you have a look at the individual rental markets across Australia, often the unit and apartment market is one of the biggest sectors of the rental market. Houses, for, for an example, um, have a higher price point um, uh, entry, but it's due to that land value component. But the thing with houses, because it has that land value component, what you get with that is you tend to have better capital growth. So the second uh, point I'd like to make is the ongoing expenses between the two. Units obviously have these strata schemes, which are a financial implication on that investor, on a, on, normally on a quarterly basis. But what that means is um, these strata schemes actually mean maintenance and upkeep are provided by that body corporate. So the apartment building or unit building and its surrounds are actually their responsibility. So those investors that want that hands-off approach, you know, this is probably a big tick for the, those investors. You know, it may be an ongoing expense in terms of that strata schemes, but what it does allow is a peace of mind and allows that hands-off approach. But with houses, for example, you need to consider what uh, the rates may be and also those land taxes as well. So the third one is the maintenance and the difference in maintenance costs between the two. You know, with a house, you, you may not have those ongoing strata fees, but any major maintenance or any maintenance within the home falls to the investor or the owner of the property. So, it, for example, you know, if, if the roof obviously um, it, it needs maintenance, that's a large outgoing and, and expense and things that need to be factored in before you even decide whether you're purchasing a house or a unit. Um, with units, uh, the maintenance and care of the apartment building, as I, I mentioned before, is um, um, up to that body corporate and you pay those strata fees. Um, but the responsibility of obviously those internal fixtures and fittings lies, lies to that investor. But uh, one of the important ones is those investment goals. You know, from the beginning, you should really set out what your investment goals are um, and what sort of investor are you? You know, as I, I, I spoke about in the beginning, what type of investor are you and what is your strategy? Do you want a hands-off approach or do you want to see this um, as an active invest, investment, perhaps you're adding value? Um, Long-term income or, you know, whether you want to flip and renovate, Houses do tend to offer better capital growth, again, because it's due to that, the value of the land, because the land obviously appreciates, uh, appreciates over time. But units do tend to have good yields, so are favorable, favorable from that cash flow perspective. And that's really what I mean by what are your investment goals? Do you want that cash flow or do you want that long-term capital growth? Um, but with units as well, you have to consider that prices um, do fluctuate more than houses. Um, you have to look at the Brisbane and Melbourne markets currently, which are really under pressure from the, the supply that we've seen of that unit and apartments and really put that negative pressure on the prices um, that have been achieved. And the last one is probably rental potential. So choose a property type that's actually in demand for your location. And that's what I meant by earlier, you know, I was saying about doing the research into the area that you want to invest. You know, what are the property types that are in demand? You know, location really is key when it comes to the rental potential. You need to seek areas that are in demand, that's got accessible schooling, public transport, infrastructure uh, and amenities all go toward uh, building an attractive rental prospect. So now um, the uh, new and established um, uh, property. So the next conundrum once you've decided on the property type is whether you want to buy um, a new build or an established home. And really under um, the current market conditions where Australia is um, going through that building boom, you know, I think uh, purchasing a new home is probably more likely uh, than it was, say, five or ten years ago. So, you know, I'm going to present a really uh, level-minded um, uh, view of this um, and give the pros and cons of both because I think it allows you then to determine what is best for your own investment um, strategy. So I want to first start off by new homes. 
Um, so firstly, with new homes, you obviously get um, a quality construction if you purchase in the right development or with the right builder. And that's really about doing your due diligence and having a look into that particular builder and looking at their prior um, development, developments that they've actually built. You know, you get the modern design, which often has the better energy efficiency and sustainability features, which is obviously a great factor when you actually then go um, to sell on your investment property. And also it comes with a variety of structural guarantees and warranties, which obviously add, adds peace of mind as well for the um, actual structural integrity of the home. And often there are lower maintenance costs associated. Obviously, again, it depends on the, the build quality, but obviously if you're, you're going for a builder who has a high quality product, you, know, you would assume there will be lower maintenance costs, particularly because it's, an, it's a new home. And the thing with new homes, you know, if you put a new, a new apartment, for example, against an old apartment, a tenant is more attracted to a new apartment. So new homes really are attracted to tenants and they will pay a premium to have that new, that new build. And what we tend to find actually with, with new homes as well, they do actually have a lower vacancy rate. And tax depreciation, and I'll go on to a, a little bit more about this um, in, in the next slides, um, are probably one of the, one of the biggest uh, pros of a new home. You know, when you buy a new build, you usually have a selection of tax deductions, such as the depreciation of the fixtures and fittings, um, and, and a, a write of the building cost itself. And, but obviously, you know, your, your tax uh, um, refund depends upon your, your marginal tax rate, and that's where you need to see a tax advisor on this. But that's why often people then um, prefer uh, to go towards a new home. You know, there are some negatives when it comes to a new home, particularly when you're talking about unit and apartments. And that's where it goes back to what I said about doing your research. The ABS put out their approval data, so you can have a look at potential um, developments that are going to be happening in the area that you're buying. Because what you find in these hubs of development there could be potential for oversupply. So the last thing you want to do as an investor is be in one of these major gross corridors where there is uh, ends up being mass of uh, oversupply, which then leads on to this unpredictable growth in terms of the sale value of your, of your home, but also it means probably there's a high proportion of investors that are accessing that area, and it means you have more competition in terms of finding that, that tenant as well. So the established market. Um, again, there's a variety of pros and cons, so I'll focus on the pros uh, first of all. One of the best things I think about buying an established home is your ability to negotiate. And what I mean by that is Domain, for example, has a plethora amount, or they have mass amount of data. You can go on and use our home price guide and, and research tools and have a look at past sales history. This is what is gold when it comes to negotiating a price, because it allows you to put a realistic figure on an established home. And also with established homes, um, you can add value um, by renovating or refurbishing, and then that goes back as well to the type of investor that you want to be. Do you want to be that active investor? And within, it, with established homes as well, they tend to perform better uh, and stronger in slower markets. And as I mentioned, with uh, you know tenants are willing to pay more for for rental of, of a new build, you. The homeowners or owner occupiers are also willing um, uh, uh, to, to pay more for a new build as well. So with an established home, you sometimes avoid the premium. But there is a flip side to that. If you're looking at actually buying perhaps an investment heritage home, these have um, a big following from a certain sector of buyers. And that's what I mean by emotional buyers, because people really fall in love with certain established homes, particularly if they have those, those period features. What comes with emotional buyers is they drive up price, and that means a higher price, purchase price, um, which obviously you, you want to avoid as um, an investor. Obviously, as well, with an older home, uh, the build quality may not be as to modern standards. Obviously, you may not have those energy efficiency um, standards within the home if the home ha actually hasn't been renovated. So there are all things and, and factors to consider. And these are things that tenants also consider as well, because it's actually the cost of running and heating a home that tenants do consider on, on, a, on a monthly uh, basis when they're actually living in the home. Um, you know, or with those ongoing maintenance, you obviously don't have those warranties to fall back on um, that you do with a new build. Um, so, 
What I mentioned about the depreciation back on the new home uh, slide, the tax depreciation, this is where I really want to actually try and dis uh, dis well, uh, um, discuss what I mean by that and the differences, one of the big differences between investing in new home versus um, an established home. So one of the biggest differences is the level of depreciation. Currently, you can claim um, from the research that I've done and what I understand with the current market is you can claim depreciation for a 40-year period from the date of uh, construction, um, when the construction was actually complete, at, at a premium of 2.5% per annum. So if the home is brand new, um, you can claim the full depreciation of the 40 years. Um, but if the home is, for example, this is the example I've given, five years old, you can only claim the remaining 35 years because obviously it's five years old. So this table really is a basic illustration um, um, of, of comparing the depreciation of a new versus established. Um, so when you compare two homes, I'm, I'm comparing two homes built on the same plot of land on the same street and they are more or less identical homes. The only difference is one is a new build and one is five years old. The new house obviously has that higher premium price tag of $400,000 and the established home um, has a price tag of $375,000. So I'm saying that the land value is actually the same. So when you look at those figures initially, you may, see, uh, may think that the older uh, property is actually a better option as the purchase price makes you feel like you're $25,000 ahead already. But with a new home, you can claim the uh, depreciation on the full 40 years. So you're paying the true value of the actual land. With the established home, you can claim only for 35 years. So what it means is you could be, it could result in paying actually uh, more for the home. And you also miss out by buying the established home on claiming on depreciation such as fixtures and fittings. So this table compares the two properties. And it, it's interesting because experts argue that um, it's land um, that appreciates while buildings depreciate. And I do, do agree with this. And um, in the table, when you compare the two, it does actually result in paying more for the land with the established home. When you look at the end figure, you're, you're paying almost just over, well, almost $22,000 when you do those calculations more for that established home on the same plot of land. So when you come, uh, we've been talking about new builds and you know the building boom that um, is happening in Australia. So one of the questions that I'm actually um, uh, quite often asked is what should I, should I consider when I purchase um, off the plan? Because for many people it's actually the first time they buy off the plan and in the current building boom it, it's ever more likely that people, um, or investors or whether it's first home buyers or um, are purchasing off the plan. So I've made a little, little diagram here to highlight some of the key things to consider if you are looking to actually buy off the plan, you know, immediate mid to, to high rise development off the plan. So first one is location. When it comes to investment, location really is everything. Um, an ideal investment normally is about 15 kilometres from, from uh, a CBD um, that's probably grow, growing as our, our, our city centres sprawl or our, as our city center, uh, cities actually sprawl or on the coastal fringe. Um, it should be near amenities and with easy access to public transport. So location really is number, number one. Second one is owner-occupied stock. So what I mean by that is have a look at at the suburb de demographics. What are, uh, what's the tenancy like and what's the owner-occupier stock? So does the suburb have more than 70% um, owner-occupiers? If not, um, there may be strong competition from surrounding investor stock, which will actually reduce the rental yield of your own investment property. So what you want is to aim for an area with a balanced mix of owners and renters. Third is due diligence. Everything along the investment journey, you should be have, doing your due diligence. 
you know, ensure the project that you're investing in will be constructed by a reputable builder. You can do this by checking the builder, the builder has a strong history of completed projects. Um, you know, you can go along to pre previous developments that they've actually built and, and inspect those before you actually purchase off the plan. You know, perhaps even talk to those, um, you know, ask for, for, for prior clients of theirs and talk to those, to, to those previous clients um, about the quality of the actual bill because it really is a paramount thing when you come to reselling, um, um, you know, a, a, new, a new build. And those uh, fixtures and fittings, you know, the finishing, finishes to the actual uh, property are a real key thing. You know, make sure that those, finish, uh, those fixtures and, and, and fittings are guaranteed in the contract of sale because quite often that may be overlooked. You know, seek out those um, developments that really have a superior level of finish because what that does is it sets your investment apart when you're trying to rent it out. But when you think of the resale as well, again, it sets your, your investment for that resale market apart. Paperwork. We probably all hate paperwork, but by this I mean, you know, check the builder's reputation and registration documents. You know, ensure the development you're purchasing has all the correct approvals. Sometimes these are things that we don't even think about doing, but really should be one of the first steps that you do when it comes to buying off the plan. Um, and depreciation is also a big one. You know, we spoke about depreciation on the, the previous slide, but Properties that have those high level and high quality uh, finishes and those extra features de uh, generally attract the higher levels of depreciation. Um, and that obviously helps you to maximize your tax deduction and increase uh, your cash flow. And obviously when it comes to this, you know, uh, seek financial advice from, from your, from your accountant, uh, accountant or your, your tax advisor. Um, and the yield. Um, yield is obviously a big thing when, when it uh, comes to an investment property and, and, and your prospects for actually renting it out. You know, research your yield potential. We have our state of the market report at Domain and we put out our, our yield potentials for each of the variety of markets. We even do these uh, for regional markets as well. So you need to be confident in your yield or be confident in the future capital growth um, if um, the, the, the cash flow um, is negative, for example. And the last one, uh, which I, I think is one of the key things, is a floor plan. Make sure that the, the the apartment or unit that you're actually purchasing has an internal size above the average um, than the, the other ones on the market um, because this will help you to maintain a point of difference when it comes to renting it out but also again for that all important resale of when you, 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 know, you really hope to maximize profit. You know, there's other things to think about when it comes to that floor plan as well. You know, look at the distance between yours and other property properties within that development. You know, what's that like in terms of, of you know, that, that personal area of that actual uh, floor plan of, of that unit. Um, and have a look at the size and locations of the actual areas. For example, car parking, you know, are they tandem? How many car parks are included? And where the storage is? These are all key factors when it comes to setting your property apart when it's um, on the market for a tenant or when you, you come again to that resale. So the last sec section I actually wanted to cover, cover off on is when to buy. So this really is all about those market dynamics. Um, when, to, when to purchase is, is one of those big things. You know, when you, when you purchase and when you sell. You know, you want to purchase well and purchase and sell it well so you maximize the potential of your investment. So market dynamics are a real key thing here. And that's, I've mentioned this a number of times, but I'm a researcher by background and I research everything. You know, research the sales history within the area when you're going to purchase. Research the, the, the tenancy, research it. With the home price guide, you can have a look at the entire history of the price, uh, sorry, entire history of the property, both sales and rental. So, you know, you can see the potential of the actual home. Domain's home price guide allows you to actually do this. Look at those uh, rental vacancies as well. Um, we have the Domain Save the Market report, which um, reveals those rental, uh, the vacancy rates, um, which are obviously a key thing when it comes to um, 
uh, purchasing a, an investment property when you're trying to decide on the location. Look at that yield potential as well. You know, ha have a look um, at what's being rented out and, and, and the yields that, that are um, in our state of the market reports. And again, it's all about research. Have a look at the future developments that are earmarked. You know, I've said this a number of times, but it's such a key thing. And people actually don't realize that the ABS is freely available data that you can download and you can have a look at what is earmarked, what's been approved to be built at a suburb level across Australia. Um, so you can have a look at those future developments. You know, what is going to um, impede your ability to rent out that particular investment uh, investment property and have a look at um, uh, rezoning you know rezoning laws uh, within the particular area and uh, potential infrastructure changes because um, when you have significant spending on infrastructure what happens is you tend to have a, a growth corridor in terms of investors um, accessing the area for uh, rental properties but also growth in terms of that property price growth as well. So now onto the all important property price growth and this was the last section actually that I wanted to cover off on is what's been happening with house prices and unit prices across our major markets. Uh, um, and I will talk about those uh, building um, building trends that I've been harping on um, throughout this presentation. And I'll break it down to all of the uh, major capital cities as well. So let's have a look at house prices um, across our major capital cities. Sydney, um, highest price uh, city, we all know that. Um, prices keep rising um, in Sydney. We had a little bit of a month by month correction, but you have to think it's a bit of a volatile time of year in terms of the fact that you know you have that seasonality effect. Um, but the median price is still above a million dollars, and we've had many um, experts um, uh, and pundits saying that the median price of Sydney will drop below a million dollars. It hasn't yet. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, it's staying over that million dollar mark. Melbourne really has been following in Sydney's tailwind. It's the second most expensive market um, and we really have seen improvements in that Melbourne market. So let's start to have a look at that um, growth across all of those markets. So. This chart actually documents the year-on-year -year growth, which is in green across all of our major markets, and the quarter-on-quarter -quarter growth, uh, which is obviously smaller, um, in, the, in the navy blue for all of our capital cities. So I'll quickly and briefly uh, talk about all of these different markets. So Sydney, for example, as I said, prices continue continue to rise. Um, despite the new price record, um, the growth rate actually is halved compared to the previous levels um, of growth that have been recorded. So actually what I mean by that is, is the amount of growth we're seeing quarter on quarter is starting to ease. Melbourne is a heated market for buyers um, and investors. It recorded the strongest annual price growth of all of the capital cities. I mean, 15% um, year on year, it, it beat Sydney. And that's what I mean by, you know, Melbourne really has been in Sydney's tailwind. The thing with Melbourne, it's really had a consistent um, growth over the last four years and a consistent rise in prices. You know, I always use the phrase with Melbourne, it's the powerhouse of population growth um, and that's really one of those major factors that's been driving um, that housing market forward um, in Melbourne you know and the same with Sydney you know population growth has been strongest in both Melbourne and Sydney and we know people moving from um, overseas tend to choose Sydney or Melbourne as their place to reside and Melbourne you know it, it, in terms of the birth rate as well is also booming uh, in Melbourne which has added um, to that obviously the demand and the upsize market of fueling that market forward. Brisbane um, is certainly one of the more price competitive housing markets. Really great for those who are actually looking for an entry level investment property. Um, and you know, prices over the quarter actually recorded a, a quarterly de decline. So prices are actually um, correcting over the quarter. Adelaide. Um, Adelaide really is a resilient housing market. What they've seen in Adelaide is, you know, it's probably one of the more modest um, annual growth and quarterly growth when you compare it across the other capital cities. Um, but this, what comes with a steady growth is it's obviously more sustainable. 
Um, it is again one of our more affordable markets, so again presents opportunities uh, for buyers. Canberra. Canberra has been an interesting one for the housing market. Um, Canberra really is reactive to what happens in the, uh, the public sector. You know, we are known as um, uh, the government uh, city. We are becoming less, or Canberra is becoming less reliant um, on the government sector and, um, you know, I think it's about 40%, whereas um, years ago it was much higher than that. So 40% reliance on that public sector. But the thing with Canberra is it's had and experienced uh, a chronic lack of land supply um, over the years and that's really one of the things that's really been driving our market forward, uh, driving the Canberra market forward. Over the last couple of years, it's really made significant gains. Before that, it was really stagnant, so it's really been playing catch up, and that's why we're seeing um, such a strong price growth. So Perth, um, declining market, um, the only market that recorded yearly and quarterly decline. Perth has been recovering from the resources boom. Slowly, um, it is gaining um, a, a stability um, in terms of that decline. You know, the level of decline, it certainly isn't as high as what we had seen. Um, and it is considered to be coming to the end of its actual property cycle. You know, Perth, we know that the reasons, one of the reasons why, or one of the major reasons, I should say, why it's declining is it is recovering from that resources boom. Hobart. Definitely one of the more affordable cities in terms, if we flip back to, to the prices, you know, when you have a look at that, that uh, price point over that March quarter, um, it was just over 380000 When you compare that to other markets, it, it, it's significantly more affordable. The thing with Hobart is that it has had strong growth. And when you look at that level of growth, it really is rivaling uh, Sydney and Melbourne, a year-on-year -year growth of 10, just over 10%. And so Darwin, uh, the, the, the last market on our list, um, houses are showing signs of a recovery because we did see that quarter on, on quarter uh, growth, but year on year is still recording a decline. So now on to the unit market. So the unit market does include unit, units and apartments, so it's meant to high rise uh, development, and I should say houses actually include townhouses as well. So again, this is the same graph looking at those median prices um, across um, all of our major capital cities. And in some markets, what we're actually seeing are units are actually in a different growth cycle uh, to houses. Largely, that is because of that building boom, which I've said a number of times, which I will go on to in the last few slides. So let's have a look at those price movements, which ha what's happening in the actual um, unit market. So as you can see, um, Sydney, Melbourne and Hobart are the only cities to record both an annual and quarterly decline, uh, sorry, quarterly growth, not a decline, quarterly growth um, in Sydney, Melbourne and Hobart, only cities to record uh, both an annual or quarterly growth. I notice I don't have the percentage changes there, but when we uh, uh, have this online, I'll make sure those are actually added to this slide. All the other markets are actually showing a downturn, so they're showing a downward trend um, in their, their annual um, uh, growth. Um, now this is largely due, due to the extensive unit developments, and that's what I'm going to touch on um, in the next few slides, just before I present this slide. So um, I should have had this slightly earlier, but what this slide does is as it has a look at house price growth um, over the last um, 10, 11 years. What I really wanted to do is highlight the affordability issues that are happening um, in two of our major capital cities, uh, Sydney and Melbourne. So what you've got along uh, the bottom is obviously uh, uh, the, the, the months and it's the price growth. So as you can see, Sydney, which is in green, is significantly above all other markets. And you can really see an excel in house price growth in recent years in that Sydney market. And when you start to have a look at um, falling interest rates, the two are highly correlated and it really does show that lowering those interest rates really has activated that market. So back to what I was just talking about and those building approvals, so if we mention quickly flip back to those unit and uh, unit price movements, as you can see um, all other markets apart from Sydney, Melbourne and Hobart are recording a decline and this is largely due to the building boom that we're actually seeing. So. I'll, when you start to have actually have a look at 
that, that building boom. As you can see here in this slide, looks at our major capital cities and the total building approvals um, over the years in each of those markets. So total building approvals is every residential, whether it's a house, townhouse, units and apartments, those building approvals. Um, the general trend, as you can see, illustrates the building boom is being experienced in Australia, particularly when you look at 14, uh, 15 and, and 16 certain markets. We're seeing some major peaks in 2016 um, and you have to think about the 2016 building approvals because obviously there's a delay from when they're approved to the construction and completion phase. So you have to think there's probably a lot of stock there that's been approved that's in that construction and building, perhaps it not even got to the construction and building phase. So what I mean is there is a lot of, of stock still in the pipeline that could affect unit prices further in certain markets. And this is where I want to just drill down to some of those major markets that are actually seeing the price declines and the markets that are seeing those large building approvals. So I want to start um, by looking at Greater Sydney. So I've looked back to 2002 to just illustrate what's been happening in terms of those building approvals. Here I've broken it down to houses, which is in the dark grey. So houses includes townhouses as well and units. So unit is basically a mid um, to high rise. So those units and apartments is in the lighter green. Um, so what you can see first of all when you start to look at those housing approvals in Sydney is that there has been an undersupply um, of houses in the market. And you can understand why we've seen such strong prices growth in that market because of that undersupply. But if you start to have a look towards the end of that 14, 15, 16, we are starting to see an increase in those house, housing approval rates. Now that um, increase in housing approvals could help to, to relieve prices and you know in, in the budgets um, you know there is um, um, uh, factors in there or, or uh, I should say policies in there to address the supply issues um, in the Sydney market. Um, unit approvals, um, if we move on to unit approvals, look at those, they peaked, uh, the approval rates have peaked, absolutely peaked in 2015 and 16, and this is a market that is still rising. When you think about the current low interest rate environment, what you tend to see is a spark in building activity. So it isn't much of a surprise that we are seeing significant levels of development because we're seeing low interest rates. Um, but there really does need to be a shift to building houses uh, in order to address, help address those supply issues, particularly um, in that Greater Sydney um, area. I know that there is a lot of development you know, in the west of Sydney, and there's a lot of development focusing in, in, in the future development in Parramatta, there's huge amounts of development now in Parramatta, Blacktown, um, and also the city centre. And you have to bear these in mind that they could um, or may affect price. Um, but what we do need to do is still uh, uh, continue to, there will continue to be opportunities to buy um, detached homes um, on the fringes of Sydney, but there is still a real focus on apartments, terrace houses and median density dwellings in those established areas. Um, so it's about densification of these areas and, pro and providing um, re relief to, to the strong prices growth um, that um, that Greater Sydney has actually been um, experiencing. So now I uh, move on to uh, the Melbourne market. Uh, these are the building approvals uh, that are in the Greater Melbourne market for houses and units, uh, exactly the same layout as the Greater Sydney slide. So in Melbourne, as you can see, when you, when you flick between the two, there's um, less disparity between the house and unit approvals. It's less stark when you look at the difference between unit and housing approvals in Sydney. Um, there's a uh, massive difference and when you look at the Greater Melbourne market, there's, a, there's less of a difference between the, those um, house and unit approvals. 2012, when you look at the 2012 uh, bar charts, was the first time unit approvals in Greater Melbourne actually surpassed house approvals. So you can see that there is a unit boom happening or, or a uni, uh, significant amount of unit development happening um, in the Greater Melbourne market. And when you start to have a look at where these areas of growth are, the west of Melbourne um, it is one of the dynamic areas of growth um, for the greater Melbourne market. We're seeing it being a major um, growth corridor. It's contributed significantly to the population growth of the greater Melbourne region. 
when you have a look at the actual raw numbers, um, it actually, uh, the West of Melbourne actually accounted for or one in four building approvals, which is, is quite astounding. But there are reasons why people are moving to that area and, we, and reasons why perhaps investors are looking to that market as well. It's because of the lower cost of land. That certainly attracts people to the area, where, whether they're looking to invest or whether they're looking to purchase. And when you have a look again at what the government are looking to do in, in the Greater Melbourne region in, in terms of addressing um, those supply issues, They've already uh, earmarked um, and re uh, looking to rezone a thousand, a hundred thousand, sorry, lots in the next two years. And again, the West is still going to be be this major growth corridor, and it's going to continue to be this major growth corridor because they're going to develop 17 new suburbs in the, in the West of Melbourne. And obviously, this presents opportunities for buyers in that market. So, just to touch on uh, the Greater Brisbane market as well. Um, you know, I think this is even more stark in terms of the boom in building approvals. It's the same uh, graph layout as the other um, graphs that I've presented. When you look at 2015 and 2016, you really can see a peak in building approvals in that 2015 and 2016. And this allows you to, and helps you to understand why we're seeing such negative um, price growth in terms of that unit market in that Greater Brisbane. But it presents a great market in terms of affordability, um, in, in terms of those, uh, those prices go, uh, uh, moving uh, in that backward trend. Um, and since 2013, unit approvals um, have surpassed those house approvals. But when you start to have a look at the peak in 2015 and 2016, we've still got huge amounts of stock to come onto the market in that greater Brisbane region. So I anticipate that will still put greater pressure on, on prices um, in that unit market. So lastly, um, the ACT, um, you know, this is, this is my home market, the ACT, so if anyone has any specific questions about uh, the ACT market, um, it is a market that I know um, more or less inside and out. Um, Canberra is really experiencing a unit building boom. We had one in 2011, and there's one, um, the boom really happened in 2016. This really has put negative pressure on price. We started to see that the prices, uh, the falls ease, but when you, you do have a look at those building approvals, they are still relatively high. So there's still a lot of uh, mid to high rise developments due to hit the market and when that does hit the market it I think it will put a further negative pressure on price and when you look at the housing approvals you can understand um, you know it, it, it's a it's a bit more erratic in terms of the approvals of houses but 2015 in terms of those approval rates was pretty weak when you compare it to that long term average and you can understand why house prices continue to, to forge ahead in the ACT market. So that uh, finishes my presentation for this evening. So I'll hand back to Dennis um, for uh, any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Nicola. And uh, look, I'm sure uh, everyone uh, listening in tonight got a lot of value of that. So thanks so much for that uh, property update.